You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 29, Food Restriction and Forbidden Food. Are there foods that are off limits in your home? Foods you won't allow your child to eat? Foods you consider unhealthy, toxic, or even bad for your child? Today I'm talking about food restriction, the controlling feeding practice parents may use to encourage healthier eating, and forbidden foods, those foods that are high in fat, high sugar, relatively low nutrient foods such as sweets, chips, and soda. How do you handle those foods you consider taboo for your child to eat? Do you forbid or restrict them? We'll dig into that in this episode of The Nourished Child. You can find today's show notes with all the links I mentioned over at jillcastle.com forward slash 029. That's 029 for episode number 29. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Welcome to another episode of the Nourish Child Podcast. I'm Jill Castle, registered dietitian child nutrition expert, and host of the Nourish Child podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of raising healthy kids inside and out. You can find more articles, resources, e-courses, and guides over on my website, jillcastle.com. Friends, I am so excited you're tuning in today because I am digging into an important and perhaps sensitive topic food restriction, and forbidden foods. These two topics are compelling on their own, but put them together, restricting forbidden foods, and whoa, things can get a little bit uncomfortable. My hope for today is to showcase what we know about these topics, allow you to check in with your own stuff, and offer up some alternative approaches. I personally was introduced to the forbidden food concept when I was about 9 or 10 years old. At that time, I had been regularly sneaking back to my parents' room, snooping around my mother's makeup and perfume that she kept on her bureau. One day, I opened her lingerie drawer to look around, and there it was. A gigantic yellow bag of peanut M&Ms shoved to the back of the drawer and covered in, well, lingerie. (laughs) It was amazing. I thought, how lucky am I to have found this? It was obviously very special to my mother because it was hidden. And it was hidden from me, not only, but also the rest of my siblings. I was drawn back to her room day after day when she was in the basement doing laundry, outside tending to her garden, talking to a friend on the phone. I went back there every chance I could get to sneak a little handful of M&Ms. But soon I grew concerned that she would be able to tell that someone had been taking them. I was afraid I would get in trouble if she found out it was me. So mom, if you're listening, it was me. I was the one who was uh, sneaking back to your room and grabbing your M&Ms. My fear of getting caught eventually stopped me, but my thoughts about candy, I have to say, was probably forever changed by that initial moment. You see, we never had candy in the house regularly only at special occasions, Halloween, or if my parents had a party, uh, we would have desserts around. I could never keep my Halloween candy for very long. I would gobble it up as fast as I could. My sister, on the other hand, who I shared a room with, she'd have her bag of Halloween candy for months. She would hide it. She'd have to, else I would find it and sneak some of her candy. Sweets, especially candy, obviously hold a special place for me. Often when I travel for speaking engagements or travel for work, my little reward to myself is a little pack of candy in the airport. 
I think my mom hid her stash of candy because she instinctively knew what would happen to it if it was mainstreamed into our family kitchen. Her four kids would find it and inhale it before she ever got the chance to enjoy it. But I often think about this, and as I was writing this show out and and doing my research for it and reviewing the notes, I thought to myself, why was I the one who seemed to be most triggered by candy? Was it because it was scarce in my house growing up? Was it because it was hidden and I found it? And that set off a cascade of ideas about how special it must be because it was hidden? Was it my personality or my temperament as the basis for my sincere liking of sweets? When parents feel they have to control food through restriction, making its availability scarce or limited, it may have detrimental effects on the child. Sit tight because we are going to comb through this one. But first, let's catch up. At the time of this recording, I am about two weeks out from a recent getaway with my husband, uh, which was lovely and wonderful and everything great, uh, a everything great a little vacation is in the middle of winter. But what happened when we were on vacation, my computer crashed and it most definitely was a big distraction for me on vacation. It pushed my stress level off the charts, to be quite honest. I had appointment schedules uh, in my computer. I had an almost finished ebook on starting solids. I had eight slide presentations for the spring that were sitting on that computer. And my new course for young athletes was also sitting on that computer. And I had unfortunately not made a backup in about three weeks. So I was stressed, no doubt. I learned a big lesson, and that is to back up my computer every single night and offload any photos or audio or archives to an external hard drive. I tell you that because my lesson was painful. The good news is um, I was able to uh, reclaim all that information and get it back. Uh, But I will tell you that there was a good week that uh, I was stressed out about the whole thing. So I learned a painful lesson, but all is good now. Uh, I just got back from visiting Massachusetts and Texas to speak to other nutrition professionals about feeding styles and practices and how they can mold a child's food preferences, their eating, and their weight. I love teaching these topics to other nutrition professionals because I want them to be a good resource of positive feeding for parents like you. I just released four brand new e-guides. These have been percolating for quite some time, and I finally was able to complete them all and get them released. So for your information and perhaps your interest, I have two brand new e-guides for athletes. One is called Fast and Nutritious Breakfast Breakfasts for Young Athletes, and the other one is called Fuel Up dinner recipes for young athletes. Um, I also have a nutrients for kids advanced guide ebook and the healthy snack planner for kids. All of these are available on my website at www.jillcastle.com forward slash books authored by Jill Castle. Coming soon in June, I will have two exciting opportunities for you to work with me. So if you're a parent I'm putting together a VIP, which stands for Very Informed Parent Summer School. It's a five-week group coaching program covering the essentials of healthy, balanced food for your child, a feeding strategy that supports regulated eating, and I cover the healthy habits children need to grow up happy and healthy. So I wanted to kick it off in June to help you handle the unpredictability of summer feeding and eating while also putting in place a game plan for those indulgent foods only summer can bring. So I'm limiting that opportunity to only 20 parents so that we can group coach together and there is a high level of interaction with me. So if you're struggling with your child, your feeding, 
um, or your food system that you have in your home and it's getting to be a little bit burdensome for you, this is the perfect opportunity because I can not only lay the foundation of the things that uh, you need to know that we know is effective, uh, but also you get access uh, to some coaching with me to really specifically go through um, your challenges. And then the other opportunities, if you are a professional, I am launching a Food Parenting Pro mini workshop series. It's a four-week live interactive workshop covering the essentials of positive food parenting so that you have the tools and resources to bring this component of childhood nutrition into your practice. I'll be announcing registration and signups for both of these programs in my newsletter. So if you aren't subscribed, be sure to get subscribed as soon as you can. I will probably announce that in early May. Enrollment for both offerings, as I mentioned, will begin in May. The the webinar series and coaching will launch in June and each will have a limited enrollment. So again, today uh, we are talking about food restriction and forbidden foods. You can find the show notes for today's show over on jillcastle.com forward slash 029. That's 029 for episode number 29. Let's dig into food restriction and forbidden foods. I did a little bit of research. I wanted to gather some of the latest stuff and back it up a little bit so that you have um, a good sense of how really complicated this can be, but also pretty straightforward. So a journal article from 20 over 20 years ago called Psychological Consequences of Food Restriction came from 1996 in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association. And this was an interesting uh, conclusion slash summary of this notion. So here it goes. Starvation and self-imposed dieting appear to result in eating binges once food is available and in psychological manifestations such as preoccupation with food and eating, increased emotional responsiveness and unease, and distractibility. Instead, healthful, balanced eating without specific food restrictions should be recommended as a long-term strategy to avoid the perils of restrictive dieting. So in my practice, I have certainly seen parents place their children on restrictive diets. But I've also seen parents just used use restriction as a means to get their child to eat healthier. So what do these terms mean? What is or what are forbidden foods? So I think Ellen Satter does a really nice job of just describing forbidden foods as as this. Forbidden foods are high fat, high sugar, relatively low nutrient foods such as sweets, chips, and sodas. So I've called these very same foods by the name fun foods and we outline that my co-author and I in Fearless Feeding. We talk about fun foods in that book and I talk about fun foods with my clients. But they're the exact same foods as Ellen Satter outlines as forbidden foods. They're high fat, high sugar, relatively low nutrient foods. All those party foods, those yummy foods, those taboo foods that society as a whole feels threatening, feels that those foods threaten uh, people, individuals' health. For the purpose of this show, I'm going to use both terms interchangeably. So I may say fun foods, I may say forbidden foods, I mean the same types of foods. So for example, the M&Ms from my childhood was a forbidden food. It was forbidden because it was hidden and it was made scarce. Depending on a child's temperament, forbidden foods may alter the thinking or the child's psychology and their eating of these foods. 
So forbidden foods would be candy, cookies, cakes, pies, chips, french fries, fried food, anything from a box, potentially, food with artificial food dyes, food that isn't clean or in its natural state. Basically, you know, what is forbidden food is highly individualized to the family, the family food values and its culture. Uh, the culture around food and eating, and even perhaps socioeconomics can play into which foods are considered forbidden foods. So when we talk about the overall idea of a forbidden food, it can change from family to family, person to person. But basically, it's any food that you are in particular trying to keep away from your child for whatever reason that food could be classified as a forbidden food. Now, you might be thinking, what about kids with food allergies who have to steer clear of allergens? Well, yeah, allergens are, food allergens would be a forbidden food. Uh, My son has food allergies, as you know, if you've been listening to the show. So yes, cashews and almonds are forbidden foods for him. But over the years, we have had a ton of conversations about his food allergies and why those foods are not to be eaten and why they are dangerous for him. They are medically dangerous for him. And so he has developed an understanding and an appreciation for why they are forbidden. They threaten his life. So that's a little bit different from what we're talking about today. Today we are talking about foods that parents determine they don't want their children eating or they determine those foods are causing harm to their children or they just, for whatever reason, don't want their children eating those foods. Those are the forbidden foods that we're talking about. And in general, from my experience in practice, they tend to be snack foods that are fatty, salty, uh, high calories, and they happen to also be sweets like candy, cakes, and cookies, or they could be soda. So what is food restriction? Because we're talking about that too. Food restriction is placing limits on the types and amounts of food eaten. So for children, that could be disallowing second helpings. It could be limiting portion sizes of food. It could be uh, modifying or eliminating calories through use of diet foods like low calorie or sugar-free foods. It could be the elimination of all junk food, all sweets, all soda, or other forbidden foods. In a 2013 study in childhood obesity, researchers found that almost 60% of parents of overweight children approve of controlling feeding practices like restriction. So in 1999, uh, Leanne Birch did a study basically called Restricting Access to Palatable Foods Affects Children's Behavioral Response, Food Selection, and Intake. That was in 1999 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Basically, they found that parents' use of restrictive feeding practices is counterproductive, increasing children's intake of the restricted foods and their risk for excessive weight gain. So bottom line, in a nutshell, what does that mean? It means that children are getting more focused on the foods that are forbidden. Hello, Jill, when you were a kid, hidden food, hidden M&Ms, I became very focused on getting back there and getting more. And then there's more eating of that restricted food when it becomes available. Say your child is not allowed to have any candy or any sweets in the home. You've gotten them. You've eradicated those foods out of the home uh, for the sake of eating healthy, for example. But when your child is at another person's home or at a party, they might go crazy and eat tons of sweets because they're not getting them at home at all. So that's what we're talking about here. They also found that children had more positive comments, requests, and attempts to access the restricted food. So I always, when I talk about this on my, when I'm speaking around the country, I always give sort of the example of wine because or, you know, your favorite cocktail or what have you, because I'm oftentimes speaking to adults and they can relate to this. So if I tell you that 
you are not allowed to have uh, your wine anymore. Or if you're if you're not a drink a person who drinks alcohol, perhaps you like Diet Coke or you like some particular drink. And I'm telling you, you know what? For the sake of your health, we need to get you in a better place. No more wine for you. No more soda for you. No more whatever your favorite drink is. Done. No more. I'm taking it out of the house. I'm removing access. We're not having this anymore. What do you, how are you going to feel? What are, what are you going to feel? You're going to feel perhaps disappointed, upset. Maybe you have an urge to be rebellious. Perhaps you become much more in a, in a mindset where you're thinking about that particular beverage, beverage more than you ever have before. So it's very interesting. When we take away a particular food, we can become, the psychological impact of that is that we can become more focused on it. We can eat more of it when we have the opportunity to. So in 2014, Leanne Birch and her team wanted to look further at this idea that restriction uh, causes children to eat more, become more focused on that food, and to change their thinking about it. So they reconducted or they conducted another study to identify the characteristics of children who are more susceptible to the negative effects of restriction. Because the question is, why, again, why was I more focused on the M&Ms and my siblings were not? My sister knew they were back there. She could care less. So why was it me and not her? So that's what this study did. It, It really was aimed at looking at children's temperament and seeing uh, if that explained the situation a little bit more. And it does. It does. So I want to go through some of their findings here. So they found that the effects of restriction differed by children's regulatory and appetite tendencies. So in in their research, they used graham crackers, which were sweet, and cheesy crackers, which were savory. So in their study, they found uh, that greater food consumption happened in response to restriction. And the kids that were more likely to eat more food as a result of being restricted were those who had a lower ability to control themselves around the restricted food. So those kids ate more. Kids who had greater levels of excitement in anticipation of pleasurable activities like prizes and food, these kids could not put the brakes on when eating a restricted food, and they ate more as well. Those kids who found the restricted food highly reinforcing, so if the child had to work really hard to get access to the restricted food, those kids also ate more. That one resonated with me because I had to do a lot of sneaking to get to those M&Ms. I had to be very careful. And uh, I think that that's what truly was going on with me. It was very reinforcing to have the success of getting that, getting those M&Ms without getting in trouble. Working hard for food was also shown to predict excessive weight gain. So overweight kids might be at higher risk for overeating when restriction has been used in the past. Those children who had previous experience with their parents using restriction might be more sensitive to future restriction uh, than children who had less experience with restriction. So that history of being restricted sort of sensitizes the child to uh, more restriction in the future. This study really shows and provides evidence that restricting access to a palatable food increases children's intake of and their comments, requests, and attempts to access this, access this food immediately after it becomes restricted. So parents who reported keeping all palatable snack foods out of their ch- child's physical reach at home had children who increased their intake of the restricted food immediately after the restriction was over. So if you're hiding snack foods, 
for example, and they're out of reach, but your child knows they're there, but they're out of reach, those kids, when they have access to them, may eat more than they normally would. Now, when they tried to look at the effects of restriction a week later, they were not able to repeat that. So they didn't see effects one week later. That, I think, could have been related to the design of the study, the longevity of interaction. There are several, several reasons that could have happened, but um, they did see that restriction caused an increased focus, an increased excitement, an increased eating of the restricted food, and, and they teased it out into the different characteristics of children. So children who had to work hard for the restricted food ate more. Uh, the children who had who were more excitable around food or other pleasurable um, activities, those kids had a hard time stopping eating the restricted food. The children who um, had previous experience with restriction, food restriction, also were more sensitized when the food was available. Very interesting. So some of the other findings that they were able to tease out in this study uh, were that consistent and chronic restriction as a routine feeding practice, meaning it occurs every day over months or years, has been shown to predict increased eating in the absence of hunger. That's eating in response to emotions, boredom, etc. when a child's not physically hungry. That's just sort of eating because you're either you've developed that habit or your child's eating because they're emotionally uncomfortable or perhaps they're celebrating. But regardless for the reason, the level of hunger that is typically there when you eat is not there. That's why they call it eating in the absence of hunger. So the irony, I think, that is so important to mention here is that parents oftentimes believe that restricting, using food restriction or restricting certain foods out of their children's diet or controlling the portions or second helpings, they think that's going to help their children eat healthier. But what this research is telling us is that the use of restriction does not reduce a child's consumption of these high-calorie, low-nutrient foods particularly if your child has poor self-regulation of their eating or even if they have a big appetite. So restricting the child who's a hearty eater is not going to work. Or if you notice your child is somebody who just eats mindlessly, isn't really hungry, um, you know they're not hungry. They just had lunch, and an hour later, they're asking for mo- more food. You know physiologically it's not possible for them to be hungry because they had a full lunch. So, you know, 50% of the contents of lunch are still in the belly an hour later. So physiologically, that child is not likely to be hungry. And those kids who might be eating in the absence of hunger or poor self-regulators with eating – they do not respond favorably to restriction either. So for children who find a palatable snack highly reinforcing, so remember, they had to work hard to get access to it. So it might be that they had to eat their vegetables in order to get dessert. Or like I did when I was a kid, I had to sneak and uh, to get those M&Ms. Limiting the intake of those foods after it has been restricted, may be especially challenging. So limiting M&Ms for me after it had been hidden and restricted and scarce, but I had been successfully obtaining it, limiting, if I were to get M&Ms out in the open with no restriction, I probably would have overeaten them And if my mother or my father told me to stop eating them, it would have probably been very hard for me and probably hard for them too. So hiding or eliminating all desserts in the home and then allowing your child to have access to them, it's likely that your child's eating of that food might be excessive. 
They might lose control. They might overeat those foods that you've been limiting, hiding, or restricting. Parents who intentionally keep all the sweets and savory crackers out of their child's physical reach had children who concern, consumed more of the palatable snack food after it was restricted. So again, I feel like I'm almost repeating myself here. Restricting is leading to overeating. Restricting is leading to out of control eating. Restriction can increase the attention from your child to those foods that you're forbidding. So the goal here, I think I made it pretty clear <laughs> that you know restriction is not the way to go. Food restriction can cause more harm than good. It's one of those parenting techniques that sounds like a great idea, but when you dig in and dive into the research and you start to see the psychological response is more eating, more food focused, more questions, more requests, more negative behaviors in order to get those foods, you start to see that we need to really peel food restriction out of our arsenal um, that, that we're using when we're parenting around food. So the goal is to avoid food restriction and making foods forbidden. So you want to be able to routinely balance These foods that you consider forbidden or taboo, you want to balance them and include them in your weekly meal plan so that they are considered a normal part of eating. So ideally, you want your child to feel neutral about these foods. You don't want these foods to be a focus or to be overly exciting for your child. So how can you do that? I have a couple of of tips for you. So Again, Ellen Satter's website is a great place to start and to get some information. She has two tips I think are great. First tip is to serve those forbidden foods. So if it's dessert or candy um, with dinner. So put a single serving of dessert at each place setting and serve it along all the other foods. The other suggestion is to serve a snack that is occasionally a forbidden food and allow your child to eat that forbidden food until he is satisfied. But make sure he's sitting down while he's eating it at a table, that he's paying attention, he's not playing video games or watching TV. At the same time, you want your child when they're having any snack, whether it's forbidden food snack or regular snack, you want your child to pay attention while they're eating. You want them to sit and attend to snack, eat it, and get up and move on and do the other things of their day. I use these two tips. I offer these two tips up to my clients as well. Serve it with dinner. Serve it as a snack occasionally. I know I've said on this show before that, you know, Fridays was the day of the week when my children were younger that we went right to the ice cream shop after school. I had to pick them up and we went right to the ice cream shop. They knew Friday was ice cream day and that was snack. I didn't try to change that or make it healthy. I let them have whatever they wanted at the ice cream store. And they looked forward to that. The other thing that I do remind families, and it's a tip I want to share here with you today, is that when you are offering dessert or you are allowing some of these fun foods or forbidden foods, don't attach strings to them. Don't require a certain level of eating performance. Don't make them eat their broccoli in order to get their dessert. If you're deciding to serve dessert, you're deciding to serve dessert. It's no strings attached. Everybody gets it. It's not based on how well you eat. It's everybody gets it. You will have to find the frequency of these forbidden foods that will work for your family. I don't typically serve dessert. I don't include it in our meal plan because I'm a little looser with just sweets and cookies and candy and ice cream on a more flexible uh, schedule. But my kids are older. When they were younger and they were in school, Wednesday was usually a dessert day. And as I mentioned, Friday after school. 
And then I was relaxed about sweets on the weekends. I didn't freak out if they got a sweet treat at soccer practice or or went to a birthday party because during the school week, it was pretty healthy, to be honest with you. Now, I did talk about managing sweets. I'll include in the show notes the episode number, but that might be an episode that you want to listen in on, uh, and it's all about how to strike that balance with sweets in your child's diet. I'll include that link in the show notes. The fourth tip is what I call the 90-10 rule, and that is where 90% of what you're feeding your child is healthy, nourishing foods that primarily come from the five different food groups, protein, grains, fruits, vegetables, and dairy, or a non-dairy substitute. And the 10% is, um, are those fun foods, or you could call them forbidden foods, but one or two servings of those on average per day. What really works with this is is if you let your child select which fun food or which forbidden food he or she will have, then those foods are more meaningful. It means a whole lot more if your child says, oh, I would like to have the pudding pops today in the freezer, um, rather than you saying, okay, today your fun food is going to be two chocolate chip cookies. So allowing your child to have a little bit of autonomy with choosing which fun food he will have uh, works really well too. And you can use teachable moments uh, when perhaps your child makes a choice early in the day and then later on in the day, he's had his fun foods for the day or he's had plenty for the day and you can tell him, well, bud, you... You made your choices earlier on today. He can learn a lot from that. He can learn to think about which fun foods he wants and think about his food choices a little bit more. And the fifth tip is to make sure you have structure with feeding. So I talk about this all the time. I don't want to sound like a broken wheel, but I think it is very important to have meals and snacks on a timely rhythm in your home, in a routine location without distraction, and showcasing a balance of nourishing foods. That structure, meaning things happen at the same time approximately, day in and day out, builds a lot of predictability in the food and nutrition system you use in your home, but it also creates space between meals and snacks or between eating sessions so that your child has an opportunity to build up an appetite. Allowing that every hour on the hour snick snacking all day long is not going to generate a child who comes to the dinner table to eat his healthy meal because he's not going to have an appetite. So again, I talk about structure and that balance in another episode of The Nourished Child, and I will include that link as well. And then the last tip is setting up boundaries. My favorite, you know, is closing the kitchen between meals and snacks. So literally or figuratively, because literally would mean you have a door that you actually close to your kitchen, and most of us do not, but the policy is that the kitchen is closed when meals are over, and snacks are over, the kitchen is closed. So that will really help also making sure that your child's eating with a rhythm, feeling hungry when he needs to be feeling hungry, and satisfied after mealtime. So he's less likely to potentially be driven towards those forbidden foods due to hunger. So I think the statement sums it up, sums this show up nicely. We want the things we cannot have. The same goes for kids. If we take food away, we restrict it, we make it forbidden, they are going to want those foods even more. And when they're around them, they may overconsume them, losing control. And when they can't have them, but they know about them, they might be thinking about them a lot more than they should be or than is healthy for them. 
So I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Were you ever restricted in your eating as a child? Do you have memories of forbidden foods? I can tell you it took me a long time to remember the peanut M&Ms and even longer to figure out how it fit into my relationship with food, my own eating, and how I have fed my own children. What has struck me most as I connected the dots is the fact that I haven't hid candy from my own kids. I think intuitively or in my subconscious, I recognized the dangerous power food restriction and forbidden food can have, and I avoided restricting candy from my own food parenting arsenal along the way. So I encourage you to reflect on your own feeding habits. Reflect on whether you are using restriction and think about, is it effective? Think about what we discussed, what I, what I shared with you here today. Think about your child's response to restriction. Is it really working for her or him? It's something I want you to think about. So I hope you liked today's show. I would love it if you could help the Nourish Child podcast grow. You can write a review on iTunes, subscribe to the show on iTunes or Android, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. Share the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, wherever you hang out. If you'd like to review on iTunes, it is super simple. Go to iTunes on your iPhone or iPad, tap the search tab, enter the name of the Nourish Child podcast, tap the blue search key at the bottom right, tap the album art for my podcast, and you'll see a reviews tab. Tap that. You can write a review. There's a little button at the bottom you can tap, and then enter your iTunes password to log in. Tap the stars to leave a rating or enter text and content to leave a review and tap send. I would love it if you would pop on over to iTunes and rate and review this show. The more ratings and reviews the Nourish Child podcast has, the more it will come up in search for other parents and caretakers who are trying to find more help with feeding and nourishing their child. As always, thank you for joining me today. I am so very glad you were here. Please be sure to give that child in your life, big or small, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out. <laughs>